This should be an exciting little lecture because we're going to talk about disturbance. Natural disturbance regimes include fire, flood, hurricanes, grazing, and it's interesting to note that some climax communities are maintained by some really extreme environmental conditions such as fire and the other things listed above. I love fire and it's dramatic to see the whole landscape turn black and you think it's never going to come back but fire actually seems to clean the system somehow all the competitors are removed fuel is eliminated or reduced nutrients that are tied up in the standing plant biomass are released and the subclimax stage is maintained so things are cleaned up pathogens are destroyed herbivores disappear for a while but as the place recovers resprouts and seeds germinate and things grow the habitat is enhanced for wildlife which will come into graze not only that but seeds are allowed space to germinate and in some pines and other plants with cones the cones open and release the seeds after a fire Naturally, fires were started mostly by lightning strikes, sometimes by geothermal means from volcanoes. But more recently, and maybe even historically, humans started a lot of fires. And there's different kinds of fires. Those that are ground fires burn even the soil. Surface fires go through quickly. They burn perhaps the grasses and carry it quickly over the top without burning the soil. And then crown fires can happen if there's laddering of vines up into the canopy or sometimes if the fire is very intense. Here's an extreme fire going all the way up the trees into their canopies. A fire this severe can kill the standing trees. In the boreal forest, the northern forest, the natural succession is after a fire on the left everything is black standing up and you can see the things resprouting from their base some of the things come back to life but the most of the old dead ones fall down as the smaller vegetation grows up so that really intense fire picture I showed you before there was a lot of that going on in Yellowstone National Park a huge fire that took place in 1988, an area long unburned, some areas more than 80 years, even almost a century. So the trees were killed, most of them, and people were dismayed. And this was a blackened landscape, although you can see a little bit of greenery starting to sprout up. Certain plants take off after a fire. The fireweed with these beautiful pink flowers makes millions, well, large numbers of very small seeds that wait for opportunities like this to grow and make more seeds. In fact, after a fire is a time when you see the most beautiful displays of wildflowers, all the nutrients in the soil, lots of sun, the plants grow quickly and flower profusely and often attract in a bunch of insects, pollinators and herbivores as well also deer and rabbits and things that eat them. So several years after that devastating fire, new little pine trees are starting to grow. So those fires burned everything up because those lands had gone so long and burned and it was the norm here in the 20th century, well the earlier part especially, to prevent forest fires, Smokey the Bear and others talked about you know being very careful about that but we've learned that more regular fires can reduce the fuel load and leave the ecosystem a little more healthy so human activities affect frequency of fire and intensity of fire and as I just said the more frequent the fires the less intense they are and the time of year when the fire takes place can have a big effect because depending on what stage the plant's life history is in. 
Here's one of the serotonous cones of the lodgepole pine. Serotonous means opening with fire, and this cone has opened and released its seeds. A lot of species have germination stimulated by fire. It might not just be the heat. Some studies have shown that smoke, an essence of smoke and water, promotes germination. So those charcoal compounds or something is, are important. And timing of seed germination is important because if everything germinates as, at once, the whole seed bank or population is in jeopardy. So some of the seeds may germinate quickly, others need to be scarified, perhaps by you know being buried in the soil and abraded or roasted in a fire before they germinate. A lot of understory plants have their flowering induced by fire, and this is because of a increased pulse of nutrients. But following a fire is the best time of all for those of us who love wildflowers and studying pollination because the canopy is open as well and plants grow prolifically in the sunlight with all the nutrients. Another kind of disturbance we see now and then down here in South Florida are hurricanes. And if you get a hurricane close by, you see utter devastation with the trees broken and upturned, all the leaves ripped off. After such damage, some trees die, but many re-sprout. And it's also a time with the canopy open for new individuals to establish from seed. Different habitats in the Everglades have differential mortality after a hurricane. We studied this after Hurricane Andrew. And people have debated after a hurricane, is it secondary succession? Or maybe what some people claim to have seen is direct replacement with many of the species simply re-sprouting. Here's an FIU plant ecologist Joe O'Brien after Hurricane Andrew with an upturned base of a pine tree. You can see how shallow the roots are and the rock that they're rooted in. So fallen trees like this greatly increase the fuel available for fires. So hurricanes and fires can interact and more intense fires with more fuel can have effects on the regeneration of plants in the understory. In fact, we've done some experiments on that. Some species have seedlings that are more abundant in areas that had higher fuel loads. And some also have greater numbers of individuals and more flowering also. So two of these are our state wildflower on the left, Coreopsis leavenworthii, and above a somewhat munched flower of a butterfly pea. Here is an endangered species, the tiny polygola, which comes and goes from sites where we monitor it. It seems to disappear, and then after a disturbance like a hurricane, new individuals appear. So it might be that such disturbance is needed to release the seeds from the seed bank where they have been dormant in the soil. Let's finish up by looking at this little chart that summarizes the adaptations of plants to the stage of succession. The characteristics listed in the column on the left of early versus late successional plants. Early successional plants we've already said are those that require light. Later successional plants require more nutrients. But early successional plants tend to have lots of seeds that are smaller seeds and may be dispersed by wind or not actively by animals. They can last in the soil for a long time and have much more shoot than they have root. They grow quickly, they're of small size, and finally they need light. They don't tolerate shade. 
This is in opposition to the characteristics of late successional plants. Few large seeds dispersed by gravity or maybe eaten by animals. The seeds don't last long in the seed bank. In fact, a lot of later successional plants have what might be called a seedling bank. Their, their seeds germinate and the plants stay small in the understory for a long time. They grow slowly, they're good competitors, and their mature size is very large. And they don't mind shade. As I said, the seedlings can live in the shade a long time.